months over the last few years. They have added in another swimming pool and a couple more cameras to the waterfront. So if you're travelling through the area and looking for somewhere to stay, the Moronga Caravan Park is recommended. Now the paddle steam in Melbourne with Cruise on stay was built in 1912, so that's 106 years ago. Started off life up around Kundrup, around Swan Hill. Started off life as a snagging vessel working for the government. The Melbourne was fitted with a 10 ton steam winch bolted down through the front deck into the hull. She would maintain safe and clean navigation ways by pulling out fallen down trees known as snags out of the river to widen the channel for the other steamboats and barges. She operated in this capacity for about two decades, sat for just over two decades in the Chuka Wharf, for about 25 years, basically left to ruin. Provided a little bit of steam up to the Edward Sawmill up on the bank there, but it was basically left to rot. We are quite lucky it actually never sank, and it was in 1965 it was purchased by the late Captain Albie Quinton. He went up to a cheeker over a couple of months, he got it up and running and steamed it down to Mildura, about 900 kilometres downstream. He then went about restoring Melbourne into the passenger cruiser paddle steamer that we see here today. We're licensed to carry 300 passengers, we've been operating two to our trips a day, normally from Sunday through to Thursday, since the 1st of January 1966. Now coming up on the left hand side you will see the red hull and white superstructure of the paddle boat Kunawara. The Kunawara started off life as the J. L. Roberts Barge back in 1894. It'd be towed around by paddle steamers on the day, fully laid up with cargo. It was around 1950 the barge was purchased by a bus company in Echuca and was converted to the passenger cruiser paddle boat that we see here on the left. Upper decks were added, diesel engines were fitted, paddles fitted to the side, and it was renamed the Kunawara. Used to operate three, four, and seven night accommodation tours along the river from Murray Bridge in South Australia right back up to Echuca. It was up for sale a couple of years ago. It was purchased by a local family. They pretty much use it as their houseboat. People are sleeping over 30 people on board the boat, still has a survey ticket, so it means it can take out a paying passenger, but we'd be lucky to see it cruise once a year. Bit of a sad sight to see it just tied up to the banks. Now where we're cruising at this point in time is our normal water level that we receive all year round. So this is known as our pool level. It is maintained by the weir coming up in front of us here for Lock and Weir number 11. You can see a rather large fence-like structure stretching out across the river. This is currently holding the water back. They are regulating water flows to maintain a water level for us all year round. There is 13 locks and weirs on the Murray, damming it back in stages. Without them, the river pretty much runs dry every year. Contrary to popular belief, this river system should not have water in it all year round. It is a seasonal river. When it rains, we have water. Through the droughts, it's meant to run dry. But the place 13 locks and weirs across the Murray, raised basically drought proof in the river system, so these days we have water all year round. The stringy yellow boys sit up across the rivers to try and stop you from getting too close. This weir here in front of us is holding back three and a half metres worth of water. It is backing the river up some 60 kilometres. <coughs> they are regulating a pool of around 36,000 megalitres worth of water. Now out of the 13 locks and weirs on the Murray, this is now the only one of its kind. It can be completely removed from the river. It is made up of 24 individual steel trestles. They can be pulled out with large hydraulic winches, pumps and cables place the sheds here in front of us on the point of Lock Island. In between the sheds is a concrete slab that extends the water's edge. That has two railway lines embedded in it that extends across the bottom of the river. That's what the weir rolls in and rolls out on. All the other weirs are a fixed, permanent concrete structure. This is now the only one that can be removed for high water, a flood, or for a maintenance reason. <coughs> As we, have, as we travel up to the weir structure, you notice there's quite a drop down to the next stage of the Murray. There is a drop of three and a half metres. For us to continue heading downstream, we obviously need to be lowered down to that next stage.
That really shows how much the water has to come up just to get through, doesn't it? Well, now the back inside the lock chamber, the lock master, once he's tied us up here, we'll start to close the steel gates behind us once again, sealing us inside of this concrete chamber of water that he will bury in height. And once we've been sealed inside, he'll open up a series of valves on either side of the gates here in front of us. So these valves connect up to tunnels, which lead into the next stage up on the river. As so he opens them up, water will pour in from the upper level and will be raised back to Kildura's pool level. Once again, there's absolutely no pumping of water involved. It is all gravity fed and siphoned water. Now when he opens these valves up, you're gonna see a lot of water turbulating around in front of us. It will look like the lock chamber's been filled up from underneath, but it will come around to the steel gates through the walls. There is four valves in front of us, two either side of the gates. They're each a bit bigger than a door, about two meters high and a meter wide. So it's going to take a short period of time for us to raise back up the three and a half metres here. Thank you. 
There's no rainbow over that side.
Inside, inside the concrete pathway, there you see these two green wind channels and three prongs in each. They're back before the invention of hydraulics. These are situated at all four corners of the lock chain. You just need to jump off the boat, grab one of these handles, start walking around in circles. And both of the closed gates will operate the valves. Around 1970, that's popped over the hydraulic rams. It's a good thing, too. Each one of these steel gates weighs about 20 tons. Bit of an effort they propose by hand. Now this barge on the left hand side here is quite snugly across the width of the lock chamber. They raise those ramps up, place it across the width. This is where they can drive the large machinery across the island to do any maintenance of the weir. Because everyone to get onto Lock Island is across the steel gates of the lock chamber or by a boat's and barge. So use that as a temporary bridge. So 
and these days are cruising speed. It's only about the seven kilometres per hour, which is pretty slow even for steamboats. Most steamboats back in the heyday would travel around 12, maybe 15 kilometres per hour. They do so back in the heyday of the Melbourne, she could do these kilometres, or about the 12 kilometres per hour. That'd be it, downstream and a flood with a guard up the tail. There's no one known to run it that quick these days. In amongst the trees out to the right hand side here we'll see these three rock piles. A little bit hard to see these days, a little bit overgrown. These were put in place in 1999 as the Aboriginal connection between earth, man and water. As I mentioned, Lock Island out to the right here is open to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's quite a few pathways, information boards, up on sandbars to enjoy the warmer, warmer months. You can, and you can get up to the weir and have a bit of a close look as well. The only way to get onto the island is across the still gates of the lock or via boat. 